All right, orientation to left. So if you're not doing anything in-house, so any procedures, any lab uh, studies that you do in-house, that's going to be your physician office lab. And if you send any specimens for outside analysis, then that's going to be called a reference lab. So there's different levels of difficulties for uh, lab procedures. So easy, medium, and high difficulty levels. So the difference between the two is that if you need something fast, probably do it in-house. If you need something of a moderate or high difficulty, then get it tested at a reference lab. Which one do you think is going to be more accurate? Yeah, usually they'll have more specialized equipment. And a reference lab can actually specialize in just one type of testing. Um, so here's some common testing. So we'll just go through the list real quickly. So cyto is cell. So we're just studying the cell shape. Toxicology. So anytime there's an autopsy and it's of questionable circumstances, they usually run a toxicology report, right? But it takes forever to get back. Usually it's like a month or two months. It takes forever. Immunology. Did you get all your vaccinations? Do you know which ones you have? What if you lost your vaccination card? We might have to get some blood and then do testing on it, immunology testing. So in that case, we're testing for antibodies. Blood banking. Do you guys know your blood type? So there's a special uh, blood type where you can just donate your plasma and you can donate that a lot more often. I think it's like every two weeks, and it's highly desirable. Your analysis. Histology. Histology is how cells form, so their origins. So for cancer, we take a look at the cell shape, what stage of development those cells are in to determine is it cancerous or not serum versus plasma you heard of plasma right blood plasma you heard of blood serum right so what's the difference plasma blood plasma blood serum so they're totally different blood plasma has the clotting factors so we don't want to store blood as plasma because it might clot on us so most of the time they'll remove it and they store blood as serum chemistry so the different chemicals in your blood so usually we'll do a t yeah ten screen panel microbiology our blood should be sterile so human blood is sterile so nothing should grow from it other animals they might have microbes in their blood, but human blood definitely need to be sterile. And then lastly, blood, blood condition. What percentage of your blood should be cells? So the hemocrit should be a little bit less than half. So about 45% cells. So if they spin down your blood and it's different, Either you have more cells or less cells, that be sign of a condition. The medical assistant rule, just like everything else, assist, 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 restock, replenish, clean, uh, collect some samples, educate the patient, pretty much anything within the scope of practice. You guys taking a look at discussion one. 
right? So discussion one, you are training a new employee in your physician office lab or reference lab. So what are some of the items you want to mention to them? And any other information? Additional rules, definitely communicate with the patient. So for example, they're doing their annual physical. When should you schedule this patient? Should you schedule them during the day, during the afternoon, or the last appointment of the day? What do you tell them about diet? Uh-oh. So have you guys gotten your physical lately? What do they tell? Uh-oh. <laughs> so you guys are not doing your annual physical. So when should you schedule them? Usually in the morning. Why? Because they have to fast, right? Because if we're taking blood, taking urine, and you don't, you don't communicate with them, educate with them to fast after midnight, then it's going to throw off all of the lab results. Report test results to physician, definitely. And alert to them if it's anything out of spec. So anything too high, too low, or missing, let them know. And every test result, the physician should initial. So make sure they initial it before you put it away in the patient's uh, charts. Some laboratory equipment. What's an autoclave? that used for yeah good you pointed to the correct machine <laughs> so yeah that's half the battle identifying the machine what does it mean to clave something what does it sound like to cleave it to clave sterilize okay so the way an autoclave works is multiple fold so it's going to be high temp and that's above boiling you guys know what boiling temperature is 100 degrees, 100 degrees Celsius. So it's going to be above 100 degrees Celsius. And the only way we can get the temperature of water to boil above 100 degrees Celsius is if we put pressure. So all three things in combination will destroy bacteria and their spores. Do you guys know what spores are? Bacterial spores? So when times are harsh, a bacteria goes, eh, you know what, I'm going to put myself in a capsule and I'll wait. So even if you boil spores, they're still going to survive. So that's why you got to put them through an autoclave. The temperature gets above boiling. There's pressure and moisture. Right? So that moisture, that water actually cuts. So we need moisture to inundate all parts of your equipment. All right, so that's how an autoclave works. Centrifuge, of course, to spin, and we spin to separate things based on weight. All right, microscope. We'll use the microscope today. So in uh, the blended assignment we completed earlier today, we went over the parts of the microscope. So in lab today, I'll go over the parts and uh, once some lady has a specimen, I'll show you guys how to, how to search. All right, the eyepiece. It magnifies how much? 10x, right? So that eyepiece by itself is already a tenfold. And then you have your objective lens. So you have a 4x. That's low power. So at all times, your microscope should be at low power. When you're storing it, return it back to low power. Yeah, 10x, and you have 100x, right? So that is the rotating lens. 
So if your ocular is 10x and your objective is at 4x, what is your magnification? How much bigger is the object through all the glass? What's 10 times 4? 40. 40. So low power, you're looking at things 40 times bigger. So at medium power, how much bigger is it? You're magnifying at 10 times 10, which is 100. And then, well, it depends. So if you have a 100x high power lens, then you're magnifying at 1,000. If you have a 40x high power lens, then you're magnifying at 400, right? So remember, you have to multiply um, the magnification. On high power, you must use oil. Right? Use oil because light will scatter through the air. So usually you'll have that, that, um, that objective go really, really close, but you don't want it to touch your specimen. So we use a light microscope. Light has to pass through that air gap. And even through that air gap, light will bend. So to fill in that air gap, we have to put oil. All right, so I'll show you guys the technique to use oil and how to remove the oil after you use it. The arm, that's where you want to handle the microscope by. Handle it by the arm and support it uh, under the base. Slides, so glass slides, we'll just uh, mark on them with a, a permanent marker or a china pen. And then the cover slips are what we're going to use for the wet mount today. So you just need one thin cover slip after you place a drop on your specimen. If you don't handle your microscope appropriately, don't clean them, don't provide maintenance, then you may damage them, cause scratches, or contaminate them. Like inside the ocular, you might get dust and particles where as much as you want to wipe the outside, you'll never clean the inside. So it'll show up and it might look like specimen, but if you change the slide, it's still there. If you change the objective power, guess what? It's, it's still there. So it's not the actual specimen, it's some mark that's inherent to the microscope. Electronic equipment. So you guys probably use the glucose meter, right, for diabetes. So a photometer is similar and a refractometer is also similar as well. So the way a refractometer works, it measures uh, sugar content. Right? So you guys know how you, you look at your feet when you're waddling in the pool? It looks like you have really short feet, right? That's because light enters the water and it bends, right? So when light enters water, it bends. And if there is zero sugar in it, we know how much it bends, right? So depending on how much sugar is in the water will determine how much the light will bend. And the refractometer will measure that. So we can measure glucose concentration uh, based on how much light passes through the sample. Right. Pipettes, we have, um, we just have the sample pipettes, the bulb pipettes. So these are the ones we're going to use. They're just plastic and disposable ones. Uh, we also have glass pipettes. They're just like a straw. Do not use your mouth. Make sure you use the handheld bulb to get suction. Some glassware, hemocytometer. Uh, so after you spin down a capillary of blood, you can measure the hematocrit from uh, from uh, from its points. Lab safety. So this is the most important thing that I touched upon for discussion one. So I talked about the safety aspects of your house cleaning regimen. So of course, make sure there's no clutter, everything's clean and neat. 
and maybe you want to check some expiration dates as well so once a month you might have a special project where you send somebody to check all the cabinets all the storage drawers just to make sure everything is within date use your PPEs because a lot of our samples are blood urine bodily fluids body tissue that is infectious that can be infectious for safety all right, the number one injury of the cleaning staff right so if you work in a hospital you have a physician lab or if it's a small doctor's lab you might have a cleaning crew that comes in at night and they clean the facility for you so those outside contracted workers their number one hazard is sharps from glass or from sharp instruments so please help them out make sure all of our slides all of our cover slips today go into the sharps container and not in the regular trash other guidelines use the appropriate equipment for your own safety so if anybody worked on a home repair or auto repair and you don't have the right tool it takes you how much longer twice as long three times as long sometimes you can't even get the job done unless you use the correct tools spills and splashes guess what we have our test kit our test kit contains fluorescent powder so I can make a spill on the floor have you gown up use the spill kit clean up the mess and then afterwards I can run a black light over the area to see if you clean everything and a black light over your PPEs after you before and after you take them off right more important after you take them off to see if you contaminate your hands or any part of your attire everyone knows how to mix 10% bleach now right so one part bleach to how many parts water nine, nine. nine. for a total of 10% right one out of ten parts 10% so just be careful follow the guidelines in your facility and how often do you have to make this 10% bleach once a day once a week once a month once a year every time you use it so it's best because you don't trust anyone who made it how long it's been sitting out so the best is make it when you use it cleaning agents are you guys familiar with the ban on hand soap so no more antimicrobial hand soap do you guys know that yeah so they ban certain chemicals in regular hand soap because it's causing infection why is it causing infection resistance right because if the chemicals are already out there these microbes start to build a resistance to it also it kills the healthy bacteria on your body causing the bad bacteria to take over causing infection so hand soap no longer have antimicrobial agents accident reporting so remember that cleaning staff right they usually don't report sticks for some reason right so we want to make sure it's safe for them and even if they get stuck that they feel safe to report it that way we know we're causing issues and problems and we can address it on our end all right so what can you do in-house physician office lab so of course all the easy stuff you can do but remember from moderate level to high complexity you have to be what MD or a PhD in some cases right so you have to have training in order to interpret that data now as a medical assistant can you do moderate level testing and high difficulty testing 
Can you? Are you a doctor? Yeah. yeah, you can. As long as your training is documented and updated and you prove that you can do moderate and high difficulty lab tests, then yes, you can do it. So you must uh, display competency. So in order to do any moderate or high complex tests, you must prove, you must have a certificate of waiver for that test. If you participate and you try to pass, but you failed, guess what? You can't do anything. You can't do that test and you can't do anything at all until they assess you, right? So make sure you don't try, but you do, right? There is no try. So if you fail, you can't do anything. Quality assurance versus control. So what's the difference? I don't know. Huh. You hear you hear it thrown all the time, right? Throw around all the time. So quality assurance is before. So before you do any lab, that's what you do before to ensure it's done properly. So what do you do before? Training. What do you do before? Calibration. Right. You use, um, you do your testing. So this is to ensure that your lab test goes on. And control is everything you do afterwards. So let's say you did a test and you got a result. So the efficient office lab result. What you can do is you can send a sample out to a reference lab to see if you got the same results, right? So compare. Most likely they got better equipment. So you can do your physician office lab test in-house, send the exact same sample out to a reference lab, compare them, and you go, hey, uh, I was okay. My lab results are acceptable. So that is after testing has been done. This is before. So a couple things, as mentioned, your equipment needs to be calibrated. And for that glucose meter, right, one thing you can use is water as your standard. So you use water, you shine the light, and the, the device will detect how much light bends. Now you put on your sample and it'll reference how much the light bends with sugar against how much the light bend with just the water. So that is your standard. Some equipment, you got to use your standard every time you use the equipment. Sometimes you can just use your standard or calibration at the beginning of the day or shift and you're done. Control. What's a placebo? What's a placebo? Remember when, when we talk about clinical trials? blind studies. So what's a placebo? What do we give them? Do we give them the drug? No. What do we give them? We give them a, a little sugar pill, right? So you guys heard of that term? The placebo is actually a sugar pill. So same thing with any lab test we do. We have to have control samples, right? So uh, qualitative control. So we got the blood cultures right there. So anytime you take a test, you got to do a positive control and a negative control, right? So I got to get a fresh plate of blood and I do nothing with it and I incubate it with all my samples. Do we expect anything to grow? No, nothing should grow, right? Because I didn't expose it. What would it mean if something started to grow on that stuff, on the negative sample? We may have contaminated or everything was contaminated, right? So can we trust our tests? No. All right, positive control. So now we got to make sure that this food for bacteria and microbes can actually support growth. So we put on there known bacteria, known fungus, known microbes. Do we expect things to grow on the positive control? Yeah, right? What happens if nothing grew? 
then that food wasn't good, right? Then nothing would have grown. Can we trust our tests? No, right? So that is a qualitative way to use our control samples. Right? So we're using blood because we want to know if this bacteria can eat blood cells. So we can tell if it eats blood cells if there is white voids because all the red blood cells have been eaten. So that's what we're looking for, qualitative, by color. Color is a quality. Quantitative is a number. So we can mix a known concentration of bacteria and then deliver a known amount onto the plate. And we should get that same amount of growth. So for your compliant labs, you must show competency through proficiency testing. So as mentioned, any test you're going to do in the lab, you must show competency for. So that's training documented and your test results. So that means we might do a mock test and we send your lab result, your results out. And if they're in spec, you can conduct that test. If they're out of spec, you can't do that test and most likely you can't do any tests for a while until we figure out what's going on. So this is relier, re, required for the moderate and high complexity. So yes, you as an MA can do moderate and high level testing in a medical lab if you have the proficiency for it. So proof of testing and education. With the patient so of course the patient education and during you want to or before you want to kind of explain to them what the procedure is like what sensation they might feel so if it is like a, so if it's like Cairo they're gonna use cold then just let them know Blisters might form. Try not to uh, disrupt them. Uh, after collecting specimen, so site care. And for you, how does the physician want that specimen to be uh, to be um, collected? Do they want it fixed, right? Because it's living tissue, it's going to start to break down quickly. So do we want to fix it, preserve it? Do we want to keep it moist? All right, so make sure you're aware what the physician wants. Can you tell the patient the results? Can you report? Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah. When the doctor tells you, it's okay to report, right? All right. So yeah, of course you can report. So normally, uh, if it's just normal results and after the doctor has looked at it and initialed the lab results before you put it in the patient's chart, the doctor sometimes might say, hey, go ahead and give the call. Let them know the results are in. Everything's okay. So that's fine. But if anything's out of spec, then let the doctor make the call. Right? Just stay within your scope of practice. And lastly, uh, record keeping. So for a reference lab, just fill out the form completely. Once you do the first few of a particular type, it makes it a lot easier. And a lot of these uh, rec forms are already pre-filled for you for the most common ones you send out. Identify and then pick up or delivery. Are your specimens going to get picked up or delivered? So outside a doctor's office, there's usually a lockbox. Have you guys seen those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So they'll put specimens in there. Just make sure you put your specimens in before the pickup time. Sometimes you mail them, regular mail, so you have to know how to package them. So any uh, infectious agents or biohazard agents don't cause a problem. Not too bad. For orientation to the lab, the more detailed presentation is um, 
listed in your announcement. So make sure you take a look at that before attempting the quiz.